I told her one day, I said, you need some help, Jody. I said, you've got this fantasy in your head that you had a rotten childhood. It was a wooden kitchen spoon that she would keep in her purse. If we were misbehaving, she would use it on us. Sometimes she would pull the car over. She would hit us with it. She hit you hard? It felt pretty hard, yes. I loved welts. Jody has mental problems. Jody would freak out all the time. I, I had quite a few of her friends call me and tell me that I needed to get her some help. That is a very telling piece of tape. Time for the Behavior Bureau. Back with my co-host, clinical and forensic psychologist, Cheryl Errett. Cheryl, wooden spoons, welts. I mean, that would be abuse. That'd be physical abuse being hit with an object if, in fact, that if happened. If it's true, you know, if, if it's true, it would be abuse. But I'm not a wooden spoon expert any more than Alice LaViolette is an orgasm expert. So I don't know. Cheryl? What do you think, uh, Dr. I Drew? think you're... <laughs> Well, according to Jenny, you're an orgasm expert, I think. But no, she was. Be, she was. That's right. She okay. was. <laughs> Joining us uh, for our behavior panel, behavior bureau, behavior expert Patty Wood, author of Snap, Making Most of First Impressions. We also have our juror, Katie Wick, and investigator and author of Ultimate Betrayal, Deneen Minette, and psychologist Judy Ho. Judy, uh, Jody paints a picture of this rotten childhood. The mom does not substantiate that. Talk to you about people who distort memories and let's assume that she actually has this memory I, and she's not just blatantly lying well, tell me about people that distort memories of childhood victimization well dr drew a fake memory is just like a real memory to our brains after a while if you rehearse something long enough it becomes a truth to us so if we want to give jody the credit it may be that she actually believes that this has happened but the degree of dr dramatization, you know, the wooden spoons, we know that Jody has a track record of being a liar. And so we don't know as much about her mother, but we do know that Jody's manipulated before, she's lied before. So I'm not sure how credible this is, but it is possible that she actually believes these are the things that happened because she created those memories and rehearsed them. And Denise, tell me about the kind of person that would create a memory like that. Forget, let's assume she's not lying, that has, has a sort of intensive distortion going on here that she distorted in spite of herself. What kind of person does that? She's crazy. I mean, just top to bottom, she's just flat out crazy. And honestly, I don't really even understand why this is even coming up because she's not on trial for killing her parents. This is more like penalty phase stuff instead of guilt phase stuff. In my opinion, the only abuse that I think really took place was the fact that they knew that their kid was like heading down nut job lane and didn't do anything to get her the help that she needed. Yeah, that, if you want to talk about abuse, yeah, that's abuse. Yeah, I, Deneen, I, I, that's the part that's most troubling to me. And boy, please, anybody <laughs> listening out there, do not let a family member get themselves into trouble because they need treatment. Get them exactly. treatment. Treatment get work. Help. Get them help. You're Patty. a good parent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Patty, you have any thoughts on this? Absolutely. If you do a content analysis of Jody when she made those statements, you'll notice that there were multiple spoon-wielding incidents, and it happened to not just her, but other people in the car. And for all of us who have, have, have ever heard that parental warning, don't make me stop this car, it seems unusual that there would be multiple spoon-wielding incidents. Yes, yeah, so when, when also, why would she hit all the kids with spoons, like some sort of like bullwhip? She's flying around the back of the car. It, it seems <laughs> not, not possible. Why is there a wooden spoon in the car? Well, she kept it in her purse, remember? She kept the wooden spoon ready, ready to hit her kids with that spoon. Yes, but that's usually something that you see in the in the, in the the kitchen, in a story that, that that has to do with in the family. So the I, I, it just, or, there's something that just doesn't really... Or let's be fair. Let's, again, I want to try to apply some judgment into the Jody situation. That's why I want to, when we talk about how she actually killed Travis later in the show, again, I want us to use our sensibilities. I can imagine a parent having a spoon in their purse going, ah, I'm gonna, don't make me use this, don't make me use this, you know what I mean? And that becomes, <laughs> and that becomes, I'm being smacked with the spoon. Maybe, maybe one time she tapped her to give her a sense of what that might feel like. That to me is not abuse. You think no, that's abuse? that's the grain no. of truth. Who, that who, the story who wants to bring in here? I heard somebody coming in, go ahead. That's me, no, it's not Dr. abuse. Dennis. Go, Katie. Oh. Uh, yeah, Dr. Drew, I just want to say what I'm really afraid of is now we saw it in the Casey Anthony trial and now we're seeing it now. Is this going to become the new norm for people that commit murder that we can just blame our parents? When are we going to differentiate? Where are we going to be able to draw the line legally? 
as to say you can't blame or you can't make something up like this anymore and blame your parents and get away with brutally killing somebody. Yeah, I mean, she's see, just this is keep blaming. That, you, and Janine, you're saying something there. I, I, that, that's she's the just going to keep blaming. I just I, this whole blame thing is driving me insane. Yeah. I, it's just driving me crazy. She just refuses yeah. to take responsibility for anything. Yeah, but and it's just blame, 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 blame. Right. And Patty, did I see you wielding something? Did I see? Did you scare I, me with I a? I brought my spoon with me in my purse this evening. <laughs> Let's see. Actually, I'm, I, I, I'm looking. At, I'm, I'm looking and listening to. I'm looking and listening to the the mother um, in her interrogation, and she's so much the victim. She's so puzzled. She yes. doesn't give any of the body language cues of somebody who would be wielding this. Yes, spoon. that's right. Is it somebody? It's how it's how a honest person. And we all respond to, to Jody. It's like, how is this possible? How could this be? What's going on? I don't understand. I've got a question from a caller. It's Heather in New York. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, Dr. Drew and the Behavior Bureau. Two quick questions. Yeah. Is it obvious with Katie in the court how LaViolette keeps looking over as for confirmation to the defense table? And wouldn't it be advantageous for the defense attorney to talk to her? Because the more she elaborates, the more Juan Martinez has... I guess fuel to add to the fire to question her, and she makes mistakes. Yeah, and uh, I'm Katie. I'm let you answer in just a yeah, second, but yeah. I believe tomorrow, okay, to control okay. room. Can I promote what we're doing tomorrow with? The, yeah, we've got a guy coming in. If you notice, we just showed some footage of, of Jody whispering something to her attorney. We have some lip reading experts coming in tomorrow. We're going to find out what she is That's talking to her attorneys <laughs> about. Well, I, everyone wants to know this, so we're going to ask that question. Katie, go ahead and answer Heather's question. That, that's funny you say that, Dr. Drew, because we were saying today, gosh, we wish that we could read lips. But to answer the question, yes, it's it's very obvious. She looks over when Juan catches her in something. She doesn't know how to get out of it. It's very visible to us. And you would think that her defense attorneys would probably say, you know, it didn't work so well for Jody and Dr. Samuels to give these elongated answers, yes or no. And it was it was interesting today because uh, Juan and La Violette had this thing, and she says, well, if that's what you want, and Juan Martinez says, yes or no, that's what I want, is a yes or a no. And he was great today because he left no stone unturned. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Mm. Drew with getting those yes or no. Yes, interesting. Now, uh, Patty, pull up your spoon. Pull up your spoon. That's a spoon. Okay, you guys, don't go away or I'm going to hit you with this spoon. Don't go away. I don't traumatize anybody, but don't go anywhere because we got much more. Jody's own dad tells police about her plans to skip town. We've got a little footage on that. And later on, uh, if I have time, I'm going to get myself back on the witness stand and ask, ask, answer questions from my panel. But the thing I'm looking forward to most is we're going to walk through the killing. Something that doesn't seem to happen in the courtroom. That drives me crazy. I have a CSI expert who's going to tell us how brutal this was and how it really went down. He has great evidence and an interesting story. Please stay with us. Or I'll hit you with a spoon. I just can't believe that she would do that because she came over to the house once, and, you know, no, nothing big, no big deal. And then she went home, and then uh, that day I, I called her, and she, would, she couldn't even talk, and I go, what, what's going on? She goes, Travis was murdered. What did you think? What the hell? Well, what, you know, I want to know what she did. And all she could tell me is, you know, later on she could tell me she was going to leave, leave the area. I go, why? And then she came over one day. I was on Dallas, just got on Dallas, sat down with my wife and we talked to her for three hours while I was on it trying to get the questions. She said, I can't tell you what's going on, but all I know is that I gotta leave. And I go, why? She goes, because I might be blamed for something. I go, what? Because I can't tell you. Can't tell you because I did it. Back with my co-host, clinical and forensic psychologist Cheryl Errett and the Behavior Bureau. Oh, Janine, this stuff is uh, very challenging. Did you catch the way Dad was immediately saying, I want to know what she did? You know, he said... I did. Yeah, did, did that strike you? It caught my ear a little bit. Tell me about that. It, it, it does. And, you know, it's so funny because this woman thinks that she's so smart. She thinks she's, like, smarter than Einstein. And she bumbles around like Frankenstein. You know, <laughs> like, nobody knows what she's up to. She can't... If she had a half a brain in her head, she would have covered her tracks a little bit better... She would have called from the crime scene and was like, Travis, stop, leave me alone, ah, ah, hung up the phone. You know, just something that would support what she's saying. She, everyone was on to her. Her dad was on to her. Everyone was on to her. She is, she's, she's not smart. Yeah, I, well, she's certainly not shrewd. Maybe that's the right word. No! But, uh, yeah, but, but Patty, the, are you as troubled as I am about this manifesto? I've got to read this thing. That, that's going to tell us everything we need to know about 
how Jody sees herself in the world. Don't you agree? Absolutely. And uh, all through that trial, the way that she smiled, that sneer on her face has affected us. I know it's affected the jury. And we want to know, just like the father, did you notice he, he log cabins and then he reached out? He wanted to know just like we want to know. And Patty, you said something very interesting when I first met you about how the, the incongruities about Jody and how she looks versus the way she lies versus what she has done has us literally like off balance. Our bodies sort of react to her. Tell me a little yes, more about we that. Go, we, we go into the stress response. What we know now is the actual freeze, flight, fight, fall, or faint response when things are incongruent. When we see somebody acting some way, their body language, their nonverbal behavior um, is doing one thing and their words are saying something else. So it uh, makes us feel what's going on we're stressed out and so we're locked in we need to know how to protect ourselves we need to know whether to run so we absolutely are riveted to her testimony to her behavior trying to figure yeah. her out and jody i gotta judy i gotta wrap this up i'll let Dr. you finish this but what do you expect to see in that manifesto if we were to read it well i think it's going to be Bullshit. really interesting if we <laughs> read it because I think it's actually going to probably destroy the defense. I mean, Jody's got so many stories, and they don't make sense, and these are all things that are coming up in her head. And if you look at the dad's reaction, I mean, he knew something was not right with his daughter. Like, what did you do as soon as she said Travis was murdered? Katie? And he's known that girl since she was born. Katie, so. you want to finish this? Um, yeah, I just had a quick question, Dr. Drew. Isn't a manifesto that sometimes tend to be something one writes prior to maybe they do going there. out in a big way. <laughs> yeah, couldn't this that's true, right? But but, but couldn't this actually? But yeah, look, it's I grandiose. Mean, this actually it's, work it's, to the defense. It, well, who knows? It's it's grandiose. It's self-centered. It's you know everyone needs to hear what I've got to say. Mm -hmm. It's really a disturbing mm -hmm. thing that a murderer writes a manifesto. The mm -hmm. Unabomber wrote a manifesto, guys. That, right. That's what manifestos are in people that think yeah. not so well. Mm -hmm. Next up, we've got an exhibit. Thank you guys for the panel. Good job. We have an.